Good evening, everyone. As you're everyone slowly coming in, welcome. Who let Mike Borislow in? That's what I want to know. Jamie. <laughs> yeah. That's my is fault. It, is I it really my meeting was at seven thirty, not six thirty? So <laughs> it's really me. Oh. <laughs> Just just finished a, a town of Lancaster hour and a half presentation. Oh, that's, that's that's exciting. Not so fun. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's really. right up. It's right up there with watching the Bob Newhart show with Daryl, Daryl, and Daryl. <laughs> Chad, how are you? Feel free to show your video if you'd like. If we don't, if you don't, we understand. Well, good. How are you? Very well, thank you. Travis, welcome back. Pete, welcome back. We appreciate you joining all three of our sessions. That's very nice of you. And Jeff Chambers, nice to see you. How have you been? I'm hanging in. Be Wonderful. Real, really, really happy when the season kicks off this weekend. And Yeah, not long to go. People, uh, people decide it's okay to not make a million roster changes and stuff. Pete, across the East region, is this Saturday a kickoff for most or no? Uh, we kicked off actually last weekend, but uh, yeah, this is a big weekend. Yep, it's for us too. And we're supposed to be expecting a little bit of rain. Hopefully it truly is a little bit. And Mary and I were on a call today where we were informed that, um, that Florida, their spring season is over in two weeks. And, and, and Phoenix, their spring season just ended. That's so strange. <laughs> what do they do now? That's what I want to know. So stay, they, stay inside with the air conditioning. Yeah, they yeah. look for indoor time now, like we would do in the winter. Right. And it's right, just a, a different reason for indoor. Yep. Got it. So I'm going to go out on a limb and say that, Travis, we hope that you are the major benefactor to this evening session. Ken has been running a programs for a while. John, Jeff, others here on the call have been running programs for a while. And we understand and we sympathize with you that this is a bit of a first for you. And so we're all here for you. Um, and I, we hope that- I feel next. very lucky. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you never know. We all will learn nuggets of information. We have two main topics of conversation this evening. It truly is meant to be an interactive and collaborative session in order to try to help as best possible share uh, best practices, wins, things that work best, things that don't work, that maybe help to uh, help you and, other, and the rest of us avoid. Um, and then at the end of it, and I'm going to guess this, this will not go in a whole hour, at the end of it, uh, Tammy, I am going to ask for you to just recap us. Um, particularly on last week's session in next steps with respect to like registration and um, the uniforms and things like that. Cause we presented a lot of information last week. There weren't as many questions as I thought there would be, but that's probably cause there was a lot of information. So, so the two topics of information we have and Travis, you get to vote which one we start with is one is recruiting, training and retaining volunteers. So that's topic number one. Uh, topic number two is activities, resources, and curriculum to if, have an effective top soccer session. So two topics. Well, that's kind of you to um, allow me to express my preference. I would say number two is what's on my mind right now. So uh, okay. if that sounds good with folks, I'm, I, I would love to, to hear more well, about Yeah, that. we've got lots of experience on the call here. Um, and so I am not going to be the only one to speak, would invite all of you. I want to share a quick, actually ask Tammy to share a quick background of the years of experience that she has spent supporting our technical department as a segue into some of the official resources that exist on the Mass Youth Soccer website, if you don't mind, Tammy. Um, sure. So at the, probably the past eight years or so. I think it's been about eight years. I have been the technical department manager. Um, so basically kind of coordinating everything that our technical department does. So on the website, you will find some um, of our lesson plans. They're usually up there. We also have now recently partnered with Mojo, which is an app 
that we use, which we're moving all of our lesson plans over to there. And um, it's a great app if you, I don't have the link. I don't know, Jamie, if you can put the link in chat if you have it. Um, I got you. You, we can send out some information on how you can get on to Mojo and access our lesson plans there. Um, and everything is done with a short video as well. So it's not only um, on a piece of paper as a session plan, you can actually see live action, the plan in place. So it gives you some opportunity to, to do some some, some different activities. And um, if you're not familiar with how to read a lesson plan, which Travis, I, I know you are, but for coaches who are, are new to the game, haven't taken any coach education, um, there's an opportunity to use this app and to, to see a short snippet video of different activities. They're not specific to tops, but they're games that you can modify um, and activities you can modify to, um, use for for sessions as well thank but, you tammy that's a great that's segue cover. and welcome jack how are you mr seal i'm good nice to see you Me we too. are on the topic uh so jack we have two topics this evening and the first topic is about uh, activities resources and session plans to make the most effective top soccer session and so we just discussed the plethora of resources that's on the Mass Youth website by virtue of the, or, or being in the process of being moved over to the Mojo app in their format. So quick commentary on the um, age group and the age group that at least in our program, we tend to focus on Travis for top soccer sessions. We tend to look at the grade three, four curriculums of all those that Tammy just mentioned and start with those because they seem to resonate best with our top soccer program, but really, you know, kind of appeal to you, Ken, um, if you've had any different experiences. Do you use different work session, uh, sorry, age group sessions? Do I? Yeah, like what age group do you usually target for the activity um, programs that you run? I mean, I, I, um, it depends on the year, but I split sometimes if I have a big number, I'll split them in half um, and I'll divide them in two different fields. Uh, but this year I'm keeping everybody together, but I do divide them by groups. Mm -hmm. So they stay within their age groups when they travel around to do stations. So there we go. We're starting on a, a new concept. So Jack, just as an FYI, we're talking about available, immediately available curriculums that either an existing or new program could use and have at their disposal. Um, and Tammy mentioned that these are all being moved over into Mojo, which is a web-based application. So you could actually have it on your phone, on the field with you at the moment. So and great. Oh, sorry. sorry, Karen. I was just gonna say all the information on Mojo is actually on our um, website as well under coaches. So you can find the lesson plans, which I've put the link to the third, fourth grade lesson plans in the chat um, and the Mojo stuff is also on our website. Beautiful. So that's the starter, right? So where do I go to find pre-existing tried and true lesson plans curriculums? Um, and there's a great resource to start with, but Ken just touched on um, a concept and I know Jack probably does the same. I know I've done the same, probably Jeff and John as well. Can you expound a little bit further on the stations, Ken, that you run? Yeah, so um, I base all of our stations on what our um, athletes would be doing if they were in our regular uh, Wells United Soccer Pro Club um, and what they kind of base things on. So I take uh, about 10 stations and we do a variety of different things from dribbling and shooting and passing. Um, I use some of the pug goals where I turn them upside down and I have them used as tunnels where the kids can kick the ball under as tunnels. Um, a lot of my um, volunteers are soccer players too. So they kind of come and modify and tweak. I put, um, I describe all of our stations at, um, each of our stations have a sheet of paper which tells them a variety of different things that they can and can't, you know, they can do and that they always can modify them if they know other skills they can do. Um, but our kids, 
I keep it sequentially the same each week, um, which makes it really easy so the kids can anticipate what they're going to do every week. We do a warm up, we do our stations, we do our small games, which I do divide into groups uh, by ages, and then we do our parachute at the end. And um, the kids really respond well to that. So the concept behind your stations is probably similar to many other orga or other organizations, and I'd love to go to Jack next, right, is that the, there's an attention span to be acknowledged and recognized in, in a talk soccer session, and it's typically kind of uh, rather short, uh, depending upon the, the players that you have at your disposal. And so it's important and helpful in order to give them some sequence. So once we finish this, we're going to do that, exactly. uh, which is nice for the station. Jack, do you want to share a little bit about whether or not you do stations in your program? And if so, if there's any different kind of pro setup that you do with them? Sure. So um, I think, you know, sounds pretty similar to what, what Ken's talking about. Um, I do think the kids like um, regularity, you know, so they like to know what the thing is. We, we do split up by age and we typically do, um, you know, a warm up that can take a decent amount of time um, where, you know, we have a lot of the kids do it together. And so it's not soccer. It's, it's, you know, stretching and running and, you know, getting ready just like any other kid to do athletics. Um, I would say that one thing, just, you know, a general piece of advice, I'm sure this is what a lot of people would say, but, you know, be super flexible, right? Things, things, you know, will not go just like, you know, when you're coaching a regular soccer team, you may come with your list of drills and you may not, you know, those may not be the drills you do. And so absolutely, this is that even more, um, one of the beauties I would say about if you do have a one-on-one -on -one buddy program is that, um, you know, if things are breaking down for one kid, that doesn't mean everything has to stop. You know, it's, it's so it's not like maybe if you're running a regular soccer team where, you know, everybody has to stand still until the one player can get in line. Instead, you know, that kid can be off with his buddy on the side you know, figuring out, trying to get back on track. And meanwhile, everybody else can keep doing what they're doing. Um, but it sounds, so yeah, we do, um, we do typically have some kind of stations. We do typically run through a, a pretty uh, common progression, warm up, drills, scrimmage. Our kids, just like any other kids, they want to play. So that's a big part of what we do. And then we have something at the end where we circle up and get together at the end. Um, so again, we try to, to keep a pretty common pattern in everything that we're doing. Good. So there's a couple of themes here, right? So we talked about curriculums, where is there a whole host to search from in a whole library, stations, um, in consistency, there's another topic that both of you touched on, and maybe we can float to another program here to, for John, maybe you could chat about is warm ups. So Ken, you and Jack, you both mentioned warm ups. John, do you mind sharing a little bit about what you do in your program as a warm up? Yeah, um, as far as a warm up, uh, it's, um, it depends on who shows up that week, right? Just like, uh, Ken and Jack were saying, you kind of have to be really flexible, but we'll try to get a couple of different groups together to do the warm up. Because I do have some older kids. I have, I have some that are adults. I have maybe five or six that are 18 and over. So um, those, they tend not to want to be with the, seven and eight year olds and six year olds and nine year olds. And so I'll, I'll have them go off. And a lot of the high school kids will grab some of the, the older kids and take them off to the side and they'll do little drills with them separately. But for the younger kids, we'll get them and we'll, um, we'll put them in little lines and they'll have some little relay races to um, just to warm up with. So that it's not just a, a stagnant uh, type of thing. It's kind of always a moving thing and not just like a line either because they kind of get 
tired of that too. They don't, they don't want to stand in line behind each other to, to do this kind of stuff. So if you can keep them moving and keep a, a fluid motion, uh, everybody moving around, it, uh, it, the warm up seems to go uh, much better like that. Excellent. Uh, so let's just stay on the topic of warm up real quick. And I want to um, ask Jacob, if you don't mind, because you've got experience in top soccer, anything add that you would add, anything new or different that you would add to this? I love John's point about being able to split people up. And I think it will lend itself to conversation we'll have about our buddies and who your, who your buddies are, uh, you know, how confident you feel in their abilities. And just to echo what others have said, I do think it depends on who your players are and who you're working with. Uh, but Karen, to answer your question, yeah, I think also buddies need to be an important stakeholder in those conversations in terms of what you can do, what you want to accomplish for the day, you know, what seems feasible with a player who, you know, might just not be having the best day when they when they come to practice. So I think all of these things are important to, to keep in mind when we're talking about uh, activities what, what we can accomplish and, and who we're working with. So let me just pause here and, and make sure everyone's aware we're capturing all these little golden nuggets. So don't feel like you have to take your own notes if in fact there's something here that you, you would like to write down. I, um, not to belabor warmups, but I'll throw my two cents in and don't worry, everyone's gonna get a chance to share this evening. Um, Two other things that we do in, I've seen in other various programs as well is one, we try to incorporate the ball as much as possible. So we're trying to stretch muscles. We're trying to warm muscles up and activate them. And so we try to incorporate the ball, even if it means um, between a buddy and a player passing the ball uh, behind their backs to each other under their meaning standing back to back under their legs, over their heads to each other. So we do try to incorporate the ball, um, toe taps, touches between the feet, things like that. And then the second thing we try to do um, is we use counting. And so if there's a, going to be a, a repetition of, uh, you know, a 10 count on a particular warm up, we try to have group counting. So it keeps our players focused. It keeps them vocal, verbal, participated folk in, in contributing. So I just want to add all that, not to spend a whole lot of time on warm ups. So some nice golden nuggets there. We talked about station rotations, um, but let's get into like the meat of the sessions and Jack touched on it, which is there's a progression in a typical normal um, set practice session. You have a warm up, you have initial activities, small sided games that lead up to a scrimmage. Um, Pete, do you mind sharing a little bit from your experiences? Sorry, sure. we're going to call on everybody tonight. That's okay. No, that's great. <laughs> well, About well, progressing your session. Sure. What I'll do is uh, meet with my buddies beforehand, and whatever our skill of the day is going to be, be it dribbling or passing, or I'll set up four or five session uh, stations that way, and I move my, my players quickly so it keeps them – from getting lost. So I might have two people, two players in a group with their two buddies, and they'll do that activity maybe two or three times and move to the next station. Everybody will rotate around and we'll do that two or three times. So they'll get that repetition of maybe doing it six or seven times, but not in a row. And they don't get bored and it kind of keeps their focus. Uh, I do that with my younger players. My older guys, I have a group that's, say, 14 and up to 20 years old, and they really want to play. So what ends up happening with them is we all do our warm-up together, and then, like, my assistant will take that group and their buddies, and they'll decide what they're going to do, and they'll do a couple drills. But generally, by midway through the session, they've, they're scrimmaging and, and having fun which is really what they want to do. They want to come out and play. The younger kids were more structured with and trying to, you know, get them the basics of the game. But I found that works really well by moving them quickly through to keep their attention because by the time they've, they've done it two or three times, 
you know the attention span it's going. So now they've gone to the next uh, section and they have to do a different drill and then move again and move again. And by the time they go around twice, it takes us 15 minutes or so and everybody's got that, but now everybody's got the entire workout in for that skill session. So we're drawing the picture of, of a session that involves a warm up and it involves stations. Does anybody mm -hmm. want to get into a little bit of nitty gritty of activities and games that are really effective? In other words, you either use them every week because your kids love them or they just have hit a, a, um, a chord and you know that they're kind of a best practices. Kind of a throw that one out to everybody. I don't know, Jeff, John, Jacob, Ken, sure, Jacob. Hey, Karen, I loved your point earlier about counting activities because I think you can take a really creative approach to what you're doing to build a skill. I remember one of the, you know, the hits of the tops practice was an obstacle course where players would, you know, run around cones and throw pennies in the air. And it all kind of led to shooting into a, a pug net at the very end. So yes, you still get the, the skill at the end of shooting, uh, but all the, the fun steps along the way really help keep them entertained and, nice. uh, you know, keep them moving through the, the line when, when necessary. That's a great warm up too, is to use an obstacle course. So that's like what hurdles, ladders, or, or uh, circles that you're using. Yeah, we had some Oops. of that equipment, but for programs that might not have any of that stuff yet, we there was uh, water bottles with glitter yeah, cones. You know, and <laughs> cones and, you know, it, any kind of sensory toys right. that, you know, you, you might already have. Right. Anyone else want to share like a specific game, a small-sided game or activity that's been a sure hit in your program? One of my yeah, one of my kids' favorite is um, we do we get a bunch of cones we set them into groups of eight, and it's one of our stations actually now. Uh, we call it bowling soccer, where they're kicking and knocking cones over, and it also gives a flexibility for those kids that like to build it up and then knock it over. So they're kind of making it on their own. They're getting involved in it, and sometimes they all get together and say, "Let's make a big." whole, you know, I put them in groups of three or four and they rotate around. So sometimes they combine all their cones and build a giant pyramid or whatever they're going to build. But that seems to be a popular one. I had done Have that. you ever put balls on top of the cones, yes. Ken, or just, yeah, okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. My, um, my um, creativity of my buddies are, is tremendous. They create all different <laughs> kinds of things. That's a good one. Jack, did you have another one? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, um, so to, to, to me, one of the fail safes is when all else fails, you know, we do scoring goals, like every, that's a, you know, everybody wants to do that. So if things are breaking down, sometimes it's as simple as, you know, the kids are grabbing a ball and with their buddy, they're running the length of the field and scoring a goal and turning around and coming back. So, um, again, we're not super tight about, you know, so if stuff starts breaking down, we, we will go to scoring goals often. <laughs> How many goals, um, whether be, whether they're full size goals or other size goals or pug nets on the side, how many goals do you typically have on the field available to shoot on during the practice part of the session, not including the scrimmage? Well, we, we have a lot of kids um, and and but so we have we have basically uh four um you know u10 size fields essentially so so we'll have those eight goals and then we'll have pug nets so it gets on the sides right yeah so you know yeah. so lots in other words yeah. um because again um that you know that is something we will fall back on you know yeah. particularly for the kids who are really struggling or something who they just don't you know they're not is seemingly getting into the routine with the rest of the kids, right. you know, all, always great to pull them aside with their buddy and, you know, or maybe a couple of them and get them scoring goals and try right. to get them back right. on track. And we sometimes count by fives on their goals, five, 10, 15, right. <laughs> Anybody else want to share? Um, I tried it um, before we get to the scrimmage, because that's going to be a little bit of our conversation, right? Um, anyone else want to share another 
activity or game that's been a really big hit? Jeff? I didn't know if you were going for your mute button or not. No, I was going for my pen, actually. But, um, <laughs> How about um, you, John? Oh, we can go, go, we'll go from Jeff to John. No, I don't actually have anything that I can add to what's already been presented. Yeah, I'm kind of more, um, I'm, I'm more here like Travis to learn. Great. Yeah, the, the, um, the bowling game is a huge hit. Um, but what we also do is we um, regular aluminum foil pie plates. We'll put pie plates near the cones so that they have to kick the ball to the pie plate so that it has to go in the plate and not knock over the cone. So some of the kids <laughs> that are a little bit more um, uh, coordinated with foot skills and everything, and sometimes what happens is they'll wind up in partners and their partner will help the ball into the pie plate for them. Um, so it, uh, they, they, seem to, they seem to go with that. Um, some of my pie plates are actually very flat now because <laughs> they've, they've been around for a little while. But, um, uh, you know, they, they love being able to work with the cones and um and we use the flat cones also to set up an obstacle course type of thing so that they can dribble in and out of the flat cones um because some of the kids when they hit the cone um they get a little discouraged because it's not going anywhere so the the flat cones it allows them to go right over it and it just rolls yeah. and they go on to the next thing so Okay. I'll share one and I don't, and everyone else, anyone else feel free to um, unmute as well. So are you familiar with fishy, fishy cross my ocean? Also called sharks and minnows. That's our yes? warm up. <laughs> that's okay. Yep. Yeah. So um, as a game, that's get them dribbling with a ball at their feet as a game, that's got them keeping their head up and focusing on the, the, uh, per, the person, now I'm losing my mind here. The, the person who's speaking, <laughs> the coach, sorry, the coach. Uh, so as a, as a function of trying to keep them with their foot on a ball, but their face and their heads and their eyes up, Fishy Fishy Cross My Ocean is a pretty good and effective game. We play it probably every session. Um, I'm not sure if we play it as a warm up or not, because I think we kind of, we do our warm up and we have an obstacle course as well. And then we play. So I guess you would call it a warm up. It's a it's a lead in activity. Any uh, any others that anyone would like to share about a good uh, Travis? Oh, did you have? Yeah, I actually had a question. Um, sure. As we're talking about these activities, I can, as each of you are mentioning them, I can see um, various ways to set these types of activities up that might be easier or more challenging and. You know, mm -hmm. uh, without knowing, um, you know, we're starting a new program without knowing exactly maybe the ability level of who's going to show up on the day, it might be hard. It feels like it would be hard for me to anticipate how challenging or easy to make to make the activity. And so I'm wondering in that vein, how much information people gather ahead of time about their participants and the ability level of their participants Good so that question. they can plan accordingly. Can or I jump in on that? It. Yeah, Where? go ahead. Uh, well, you can set up your activity, and then your buddy who's working with the with the player that day, they'll know whether they're having a good day or a bad day. So you can get your buddies to push them a little harder on the good days, where they can. In most of your activities there's a way to make it a little more difficult without changing the entire activity and the buddies can actually do that once they learn the right you know they, they learn their players i would say, i think also uh in that you're absolutely right thank you pete i think jack mentioned something a little bit earlier as well which is best laid plans may not work out and you're going to have to pivot and adjust and accommodate and change. So don't come with a structured plan that doesn't allow for any kind of innovation to it. Um, I, I so like you to won't tell know. new coaches, 
I like to tell new coaches, if you're coaching a typical team, you go to practice with plan A and plan B. Here we go to practice with plan A, B, C, D, E. And sometimes we have to wing it all the way out to F. But that's just the, the nature of what we do. But to your question about do you gather information, great question. Um, probably the best information you're going to gather is when they show up that morning or that day, right? And it's going to be from their parents. And so you're going to, add, so I, I, I'd be very interested in other people to weigh in on this. Having an active conversation with the parent as you're meeting the child. And of course, you know, we have all our buddies get down on one knee in order to be eye level with the, with a player and then have an active conversation with the parents. You know, what do I need to know about today? Is there anything special? Um, and so are there any triggers I need to know about? So be very interested in others to weigh in on the topic of how do you glean the best effective information from parents? And feel free to unmute if you'd like. I don't know, Jacob, you've had a lot of buddy experience, right? Yeah, Karen, I think that's an awesome point. And I would say I was most impressed with the parents who were open to joining the activities too. And sometimes players were having difficult days. You know, the parents that chose to stay around and, and lead their players through activities at times, uh, to me, just reinforce the sense of community that's present within tops and you know i think there is an understanding especially with uh, parents who have children on the spectrum who have certain needs uh, they want to see their their child succeed they want to see their players succeed and you know will hopefully be in a position where they they trust their buddies they trust the coaches at tops to to lead their child through these uh, challenges, to have fun, to develop skills, but sometimes they they just need to be present. And I think getting that information, working with the parent, inviting them to stay when necessary are all really, really good ways that, like I said, A, you can build community and B, learn a bit more about what your players need, what they're gonna best respond to and, and things of that nature. Thank you. Yeah, I, I find I find that the the parents, like Jacob was just saying, the parents of these kids want to tell you what is going on. Um, I had three emails today from uh, players that hadn't registered yet, but their parents sent emails saying, "Hey, we're coming Sunday," um, and two of them are brand new, and the two that were brand new went into detail of what to, I should expect from their kids when they get there. And they're actually bringing their caretakers with them and asked, could they be allowed to go on the field with them and work with them? Because they know the trigger signs. They know how this particular person reacts to different things. Uh, one of them, she said, if he gets real excited, um, he has seizures right. and some of the seizures last from 15 to 20 seconds. And if someone's not prepared for that, right. that's something that could really shock a 15 year old, right. <laughs> that buddy that's with them. Right. Great so point. all good information. And it usually comes right out. It, right you don't parents. have to go fishing for that. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they definitely uh, get involved um, and you want the, you want the parents and those people anybody that wants to be involved like that i welcome them all in because we're not healthcare professionals we're not you know we, we're not child life specialists uh, you know we're, we're trying to give the kids a really good spot to play soccer and be out in the field and and hopefully give their parents a a little rest, at least an hour rest. Yeah, at least yeah. one hour. Yeah, <laughs> at least. Um, so we're we're nearing the halfway point of tonight's session, and we want we don't want this half of it to end without talking about the scrimmage. Um, so Jack, if you don't mind, I want to defer to you because I think one of the best scrimmages or games, full side games, that I've ever seen in action that include buddies and 
uh, players, but in a very effective manner is probably been at Jack's program. Do you, do you mind sharing with us how you guys format yours? Uh, sure. So um, I, again, we have a lot of kids, so we have the ability to split up by age and, and ability. So, you know, that is an advantage in some sense that we're able to group players that are more common, um, you know, c common, have a common ability to play at a certain level. So that's an advantage for us. Um, then we spend a, a lot of time trying to explain to the buddies what we want them to do. And, you know, and so, and that's individual to who their player is. So, um, so, you know, we kind of tell them, you know, this is, this is their game, right? This is the kid's game, but you're out there, you have on a penny so that, you know, it's clear that you're on their team. And, and if your kid, if your buddy is not getting the ball or is standing in one place or whatever, your job is to change that. And, and so, um, and so, you know, some of the buddies accordingly won't have to do anything because their player is fully engaged and is running up and down the field and sharing the ball. Um, and other buddies will need to take an active role. And also, you know, we, we get the buddies to, you know, make the game even. Um, and so, you know, sometimes the buddies will be more engaged in getting the ball down the other end. You know, so, you know, when I go out on the field, I, I whisper in their ear, get the ball down the other end. You know, it, you know, we have 12 goals at this end. We need to down the other end, you know, stop letting Michael carry the ball, the whole thing and kick it into the goal. Like somebody, you know, like we need to address it. So again, I use the buddies a lot. Um, and, and I don't have any magic beyond that. Um, but again, um, really uh, important to understand what the buddies role can be when they're out there okay. on the field. One thing I noticed and observed at your sessions too, Jack, is that your buddies keep the ball in play. So as will happen, sometimes, you know, the ball is going to ricochet or a player is purposely going to kick it way out of play. So the buddies just keep it in play, um, which keeps it active. And sometimes you may even want to entertain a second ball in play, but yeah, absolutely. And, and to be yeah. clear, so like we also, so we don't do throw-ins, right? right? You know, like more or less, we try to keep the ball inbounds. If it goes out, we kick a second ball in. But if it does go out, we play kick-ins just to, right. you know, keep the ball, keep the game going. Um, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're, we're not going to win any tournaments or anything. We're just trying to get out there and kick the ball around, so... So other, as we wrap up kind of this half of the, the session, other top, other conversations or points or trivia um, that would be helpful as it relates to getting to the, which is by the way, just like a regular session should be the largest, largest component of your session. The parents really look forward to the gross motor skills development in you tiring them out. They want you to tire out their kid. Um, uh, but of course, for them to have, have as much fun possible as doing it. So spend the largest, if you can, the largest proportion of the session actually playing the game. Any other comments on that? And then let's just close the day with um, real quick, 30 seconds or less. Those of you who want to weigh in on this, how do you end your sessions? Feel free to unmute anybody. So I'll go. So we, we um, afterwards, we, we, um, we gather together by group again, you know, not necessarily everybody together, but we gather together by group. We, uh, before we leave the field, we have a Rovers cheer. That's the name of our program, Rovers. So, you know, um, treat it very much like a team. Um, I will say that we do this when we first get there, as well as when we leave. We talk about the Red Sox, the Patriots, uh, you know, what somebody did that they weren't supposed to do at school. Um, you know, we, we, you know, these kids are now buddies. Um, you know, they've, they've, you know, been together. They like being with their team. They like goofing around. You know, we have a little bit of fun. Great. Ken, John, uh, Jeff, Jacob, anybody want to else share how you end your session? 
We yeah, use, yeah. Um, oh, we use a parachute. Yeah. We use, oh, that's right. We, use a, we do two of them. Um, I have a, a smaller parachute for the younger kids. And then I have the real large parachute for the older wow. kids. So we kind of just split up into two Great. different groups. And? We usually bring our we usually bring our two groups together because the older guys will be playing and our younger group will finish their scrimmage, bring them all together, and our parents will make like an arch and everybody runs through the arch at the end. We do that too. That's so they love that. Like a victory arch. Yep. Yep. That's generally how we end. Anything else anybody want to add to that? I'll add one other thing that we do. So um, in our program, it, it we tend to have a lot of, well, we tend to have probably one new player and one new buddy a week. It's, it's a rather frequent occurrence. And so we always recognize the new player and the new buddy. We ask them to stand up, everybody big cheer for a new player or a new buddy. And then we do happen to have a couple players um, who like who are kind of exhibitionists they like to show off their dance moves. So we'll call them up and they'll do a dance move, right? Um, and we actually give out little raffle tickets to each player and buddy that they can go redeem at the concession stand for either a, an, a food item or a beverage item. Um, and we also do the tunnel, which is a big hit. So lots of different ways you can do it. You don't have to do it all. Uh, whatever works best for your, your group um, is great. Wonderful. Lots of great exchange here. Um, so let's, uh, realizing the time, I think we can do this in about 10 minutes or less. Let's just pivot to the other topic, which is attracting, training, and retaining volunteers. So you've got a lot of um, information or a lot of sources of information on this call. Let's see if, if we can go around the bend with everybody 30 seconds or less, what's your most successful um, recruitment strategy? We'll start with you, Ken, because you're the you're on my screen first. <laughs> um, so mine is I have um, leaders, I have student leaders from my set from my groups every year. When my seniors graduate, I have new, I have them nominate new volunteers to be our leadership. This year I have three. Uh, last most of them are two, but they're my bread and butter. Without them, I would not be anywhere. They have an Instagram page. They have a Facebook page. They oh. get into the key club. They get into the uh, parent advisory council. I'm an adapted phys ed teacher. So I email all the, te the schools and I let them know what our program is. But 99% of it is from my leadership of the kids. Great. And I find their friends then come and other friends come. Uh, that's really the, where the retainment comes every year. Um, Thanks, Ken. Yeah. So if I pick on you and, and I shouldn't, please feel free to say, you know, uh, this is not my my wheelhouse, but I'm going to go to Jacob next and see if, uh, Jacob, you've got some tried and true um, ways from your programs. Yeah, I call in the high schoolers for sure. And for most of them, they also need volunteer hours and service hours. And that was a really easy way to encourage uh, kids that want to play, you can also reach out to the high school team, uh, both the boys and girls team. And uh, there's absolutely going to be a handful of them that a either need the hours or b want to work with that population and want to be around that space. Great. Thank you. So Jamie, I'll call on you if you'd like to share with us any ideas that you have, but feel free to say no. No, I was going to go off of Jacob's, um, like high school teams, maybe not even just high school soccer teams. Um, I would, I think with any sport, this could be um, applicable to be um, a buddy. And then also maybe reaching out to like athletic directors um, because they could get the word out a little bit better um, to like the head coaches of each sport. John? Um, yeah, our program wouldn't be a program without the high school uh, boys and girls soccer teams um, actually have the coach of the boys varsity and JV and the girls varsity and JV team for King Philip that um, actually reach out to me and want to know when uh, he should start pressuring his kids to show up. <laughs> so I, I replied back, said April 10th, have them show up. <laughs> and uh, 
And then he copied me on an email that he sent out to his team and said, you know, uh, this isn't required, but it's highly recommended because once you do it, you're going to continue for four years until you go to college. Because if your coach says to do it, you're going to do it, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so lots of high school penetration uh, with respect to recruitment. Um, anyone else besides the high school population? Any other ideas on the on the uh, call tonight? In Danvers, they actually reach out to the the current players as well as. Not, not just the high school. The youth players, right? Um, they, to their youth yep. players, um, you know, right. like the sixth, sixth through eighth graders. Right. Um, as well, and you get them for even longer if you can keep them through the end right. of high school. Yeah. I'll add one more in case uh, if um, maybe somebody was going to mention it as well, that they, the local colleges and universities are actually a fantastic source. Um, not to mention, it, as long as your program doesn't start at eight in the morning, Okay, let them sleep in from their previous night of partying. But in, in any event, they're, uh, they're tremendous. That You know, they don't have the, um, there's no intimidation factor. There's no self-consciousness. There's no question about what they're there for. Um, they're not timid or shy. They truly are there um, in, an, in an entirely different spirit. So we love our high schoolers as well. In fact, we actually have a scholarship program to try to continue to support that ongoing, but the colleges have been very effective as well. So let's move on to training. Um, I get, call my friend. Put one thing in there? I'm sorry? Can I put one thing in there? Of course. One of the things I do, and we've been very successful with it, is we have like a, I, I pull buddies out of two high schools. And from each high school, we have like the lead buddy who does all of the texting and stuff back and forth with the rest of the crew and they tend to answer them a lot quicker than they answer me <laughs> so if you get two responsible kids or one responsible one and in one family we're in the third one now we had a girl who was a senior she went to college her younger brother who was a sophomore took it over and now the youngest the last one the third is a sophomore and she's taking it over now as the third one in the family, as our lead buddy. And without them, I don't know what I would do because they get them, everybody organized and everybody shows up on time, ready to play every weekend. That's awesome. So hey, it also Karen? gives them more ownership yes. of what they're doing. So so if I, if I can just add two other nuances on this, I agree with what everybody said. Um, you know, as Ken started off, we, we call those people ambassadors. You know, okay. so, you, you know, and they're the people who we get the big numbers from. But two other nuances I just throw at you. We have had mixed experiences going through the coaches. We have had some coaches. Uh, all the coaches are super supportive. But do we get players from their teams? Very mixed. Um, I just think sometimes the coaches in the season are too busy and that's not you know, so it, it's not that they don't want to help, but it just, it doesn't happen. So one of the things I've done is say to the coach instead, can I speak to your, your people for five minutes after practice and just go direct to the kids with the flyer in hand. And as other people have said, if you can get the captain or the people who are the leaders involved, the rest of the kids will do it. And, and, you know, they may even feel they have to. So Good that's point. one yeah. thing, thing. That's okay. <laughs> you know, that, that, that's one thing that I would just say is that, you know, we have gone direct that way at times when we weren't getting through through the coaches. Um, and a second, another just nuance on that is another thing we've done before is go to the boosters. So sometimes, um, you know, some of the uh, – probably every team has an informal, you know, basically boosters, you know, basically the captain's moms, you know, are kind of running the booster team, but some, some schools actually have the, the boosters listed on their website. So mm -hmm. it has the people who are the boosters for that team. And we've gone to them before. And um, uh, I, th I think it can be a very effective way because, you know, those people are looking for a role. 
right? Yeah. You know, they want to be involved. That's why they signed up for it. They can be another helpful conduit. And it's another way to go around the coach, basically. So great pockets and pools of resources to draw from. Um, and one thing for sure is as soon as you get an engaged buddy or two, they, they tend to bring their friends as well, which is great. So real quickly, I don't know if you can do this, Tammy, or not, but let's track, let's touch quickly on training, training buddies. And um, I ask you, Tammy, because Ian Milliner is in Massachusetts anyways, is one of the very few certified top soccer trainers. We do have others. So I don't want to suggest that Tammy can commit Ian or whatnot, but Tammy, do you want to just speak to how, um, what we have as possibilities in order to schedule a group training of buddies and coaches. So absolutely what we can do. I mean, if there's enough interest, we can see if we can work something out later in, in the spring. Um, the problem right now is, are you looking and maybe Karen, you can elaborate a little bit. Are you looking for something right now or something down the road? Um, cause obviously we're heading into the spring season now, so it might be a bit too late for that piece, um, for the spring, but it's definitely something we can set up for the fall. Um, probably where, during the summer for the fall. Yeah. Oh yeah. During the summer yeah. for the fall where we either, either hold it at one location or, and regionally as an option too. Um, right. you can come together. Ian can run sessions to train your buddies and your coaches. Um, another thought I, I've had too, is I attended the coach um, certification course that, that um, was run in Maryland. And I think that's a great opportunity and I'm trying to right now um, see if we can run that even virtually at some Which point. Which was a virtual, right. It, it, was, a great, it was a great course. Um, and I think it, it, it's a, something that we should be able to offer each season as well. Right. For, so I would say a regional training for buddies and um, a full coach certification course each summer um, would be something if, if everybody thought was a good idea that you could get your coaches and your buddies involved in, we would certainly like to schedule something like that. And Ian is by far the best resource. He's just the best at it. I, I am also certified. I will tell you, Ian is better. <laughs> um, but I have started many a program and trained many a group of volunteers. Uh, I just think Ian's better at it. Um, so we have the opportunity to do that, Travis, for you personally, if your group is starting this spring and you uh, want to set some training up, I'm happy, uh, you know, spring's a pretty busy season for Ian. I am happy to come and join. Um, John would probably come with me and we would sort of, we would train your, your group together. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so we have about seven minutes left. We were going to talk about retention, but I would like to like to suggest we pivot quickly um, and ask if Tammy, can you um, for our takeaways uh, here, harken back a little bit to last week's session and talk a little bit further about um, next steps because I. I could be wrong. I do happen to think there was a lot of information that people may have written down and taken away, but it might be worth repeating uh, for this okay. group. So next steps. I mean, the first is I would suggest, highly suggest that you register your your tops participants um, using this the outline that was provided last week. Um, and that's it's not mandatory for the spring at all. Um, it will be mandatory for the fall, but like I explained last week, and I think most of you were on the call last week. I know Jeff wasn't, Jack, I'm not sure if you were, actually you were on the call last week. So um, the fall, it will be mandatory, but we're going to be using, it will be easier for us to judge uniform shirt numbers, um, quantities to send out to the programs if we have a rough idea of how many players you had this spring. And I understand that the numbers might be lower this spring just because people are now starting to get back into coming out and being participating in these group activities. Um, but it's a starting point for us. 
people survey you as well, but it is definitely um, something that I would suggest we do. Um, some of the other things we did talk about with the uniform program for both the shirts um, for the players and for the buddies. Um, Jack actually emailed me this week with a suggestion um, and I'm looking into that Jack is they don't use name tags. They actually write their names on their shirts. Um, they have a box. So I'm seeing, I am actually asked um, score if they can place like a kind of just a blank label type thing on the shirt, where if you want to use that as the name tag for the child, you can use like a laundry marker um, or a fabric marker. That's a great idea. Which won't come out in the, in the wash. Um, so I did, I uh, haven't heard back from score yet, Jack, but I did definitely, cause I thought it was a fabulous idea. Um, they don't fall off. Kids can't play with the, you know, they're not fidgeting with the name tags or whatever. It's sometimes it's a sensory issue with that, like it gets bunched up or it falls off. So that's a, a suggestion that we had there. Um, as far as just a reminder that we have the Tops uh, Fanfair uh, store open, and that is on the Tops Soccer portion of our website. If you haven't looked at it, there's some great options. I would suggest if you're gonna order and you're gonna order as a group, you might wanna combine your orders shipping so I noticed this week shipping was a little expensive. Um, so if you combine your orders, I think you get the better, better bang for your buck. So if you have a bunch of coaches that are looking to, to buy stuff um, that you do it as a group order. Um, but there's some fabulous stuff there as well as equipment that if you need to order, I think it was somebody referenced the flat, um, the flat cones or the flat discs, those are available. The smaller cones, the larger cones, some of the sensory stuff, that's all there. So, and then there's also the option for the discount for nets if you're looking for some of the portable nets um, from Quick Goal. So, I think really the next step is if, and I would again just reiterate this is optional, but I would really love to see if we can get y'all to register your, your players and your coaches and make sure that they do all your adult registrations are all complete. I'm sure Mary, Mary can speak better. Yeah. That, that I'm glad I you mentioned that because and, and Mary, thank you for your patience because I know you've been on for the whole session, but really this is the plug, right? So do you want to take another two minutes, Mary, and um, plug the importance for all of the adult volunteers and any top soccer program to do uh, their due diligence? Yeah, so I actually joined to learn more about the program. Thank you all. It's, uh, <laughs> it's great to hear um, how it's run. But I'd be happy to just uh, say again that your adult buddies that are 18 years or older um, that are not a sibling participating, right? So a regular buddy, 18 years or older, that's participating is an adult athlete. They need to register with Mass Youth Soccer, choose the program they're participating with when they register. And we need to make sure then that kicks off their background checks. We'll process the background checks on them. Make sure the background check approved. Um, that is state law. And um, also make sure that they do the safe sports training. That's federal law. And are in um, compliance with the concussion policy, which is US soccer. So it's, it's really important because those are laws and policies that we all have to follow. All right. And if you have any questions on that, you know, email me. And like I said, we do have the help guides up on the website, the Massachusetts Soccer website, adult registration webpage. Um, and, and I can clarify if you have questions about who really does have to register. So much. Mary's a wonderful resource and boy, she, she is um, a stalwart at the details. Jeff, did you have your hand up? Yeah. Um, questions for, I guess, Tammy and Mary. But so the player participant upload and the buddy upload would just be using the regular template like we always use but with the ts in, in that's the, correct yeah uh, play level column um on the adult side so if we have adults that are volunteering and so forth is the fee waived for them also and do they need to be specially how how are they identified if they go in through the adult registration system as being with top soccer 
you'd be registering your adults through the registration system also as TS. So they're identified there. They're not being charged for Mary when they, uh, I'll let Mary talk about what happens when they register in the adult registration system. So. Right. So, so when, when they register, right, they register to that secondary program, the top soccer program that they're going to volunteer with, um, or that's their primary program. But we don't have a way to separate them out as to like they are truly just top soccer volunteers. So at, at that point, if there's a, a question with it, um, Matthew Soccer might come back to you and say, oh, you have this many adults listed, you know, can you tell us why or whatever you can come back and say, Michael, Mike's going to chime in. Yeah, let me if, jump in. Real, uh, so when the uh, fee submission form is completed with the number of adults on there that have registered, because that's going to be matched up against the registration system, a simple notation on there letting Rachel know that these are tops uh, soccer only uh, you know, buddies, and thus she'll deduct that from what would what would need to be paid. Right. So I would say that's in the email, right, Mike? Because I don't think you can note it on the form, but you can note it in the email, then you send it to yeah, her. Yeah. Well, if it either some people still do send in paper forms. Uh, it's an Excel spreadsheet, which they could actually type it on and or in okay, the email. Good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You can't edit the Excel. Um, yeah. The numbers. But, you just, but I, guess, I guess I guess what my thought was, you could always send it in as a separate form and put, you know, Danvers use soccer dash top soccer or something. Well, right. the preference is to have it all because uh, as we're conducting audits uh, across the board is that we will take a look at, there's 38 adults in U.S. Soccer Connect and there was yeah. 32 adults on uh, fee submission form. We're going to look for those missing six, but if they yeah. match, the numbers match up, uh, Rachel prints all of those forms out, makes any notations on it. So, uh, so the audit would be correct. All right, thank you. Yep. So Tammy, Mary, Mike, thanks for um, the follow-up from last week and previous weeks on next steps. We'll remind you all um, that you, the stalwart group who has been to every session or at least one of three sessions um, are one of many out there advocates for our children with special needs in order for them to enjoy the sport alongside their, alongside their able-bodied contemporaries. And so we salute you, we thank you, and we really are, are very, very grateful to have you doing what you're doing. This is the beginning, again, of our kickstart. I truly do believe that 2022 is the start of a, of a refreshed approach that's going to see top soccer programs increase in volume and effectiveness in the collaboration between them to increase to the point where really it is our hope to have a, some league based, excuse me, league based play, whether that be strictly top soccer players or an integrated program. It exists already in Massachusetts, but not in a broad based capacity. In this group here, kind of those that are related through our town based programs is probably the best foundation to, for that to take off. And I do believe that 2022 will be the start of this. We may not see it until 2023 or beyond, but this group is going to be the start of something, um, something else great more than what we have today. So thank you to Jamie, uh, Tammy, Mary, Jacob, Michael, um, for all of the support and efforts that have gone into this workshop series, as well as the ongoing support for Top Soccer as a program and our membership that, in, that are all special needs. And thank you to all of you who run Top Soccer programs or are interested in starting them. And Pete is our regional director for Top Soccer. Thank you for joining us for all three sessions representing the region. Um, it's been a wonderful level of support for us. So thank Mark you. Was Top soccer is alive and well in mass. It is, it is. And thanks for joining us. Wonderful. Thank Have you. a wonderful evening, all of you. It's been great to see you again. Have a good night. You too. Thanks.